I always promised myself, I saw this in people and anybody listening to this, if you were in the military, you've seen this in people, the E6 or like O3, who's just like rotting toxic in a position because they're like, well, if I just ride out this five years, you know, I'm going to retire. A job with such high stakes is not like a well, fuck it type scenario. Hi, I'm Daniel Bell. And I'm Patrick Brennan. This is Aftersoft. Today, our guest was Remy Rowe. Remy Rowe is a retired U.S. Army Special Operations Combat who is currently a staff member at the Stanford University School of Medicine Center for Immersive and Simulation-Based Learning. He spent 15 years in the op Army operating across six continents and serving multiple combat deployments to Iraq and Afghanistan. Today, Remy is currently a Ph.D. student studying developmental psychology and he has a master's degree in personality psychology and sociology. He currently lives in Menlo Park, California and enjoys hiking, traveling, and coaching Olympic weightlifting in his spare time. Remy has a great story and a great journey uh, from his interesting family life growing up in Compton, California, uh, to the incidents that made him join the military and the army transitioning to soft medicine, becoming a Purple Heart recipient, uh, earning three master's degree, and, and now a professor at Stanford University, one of the leading institutions in the world, uh, and working on his PhD. He's just got a phenomenal story, and uh, I'm glad you guys get to watch it. You joined the Army when we were in combat. What was it that drew you into joining the Army and and the particular MOS and everything else you did? Uh, I didn't want to go to jail. <laughs> that's, uh, that's a yeah. good motivator, yeah. <laughs> Fun start. Uh, yeah, 2006, I was um, I was like a punk-ass kid, man. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm from South Compton, California. Okay. Um, I had gotten in trouble again, and a judge was like, dude, I'm sick of you. You're, you're, you're going to go to county at this point. I, was, uh, I had just turned 18. And at the time, I was lying. I like put on the alligator tears and I was like, I'm gonna join the army and change my life because this was the height of the surge. Mm. So I already had a neck tattoo at this point. If you had a pulse, they were like, come on boy, right? <laughs> so uh, <laughs> um, the judge was like, no way, you can't get in the army. Uh, I brought a recruiter to court uh, <laughs> and he was like, yeah, I can get him in. Uh, so that's legit, just being honest, man. Uh, <laughs> That is how I wound up like joining the army. Uh, and then having, having been an athlete, uh, like, a, like a lot of people joining big army, uh, like I felt like training for the conventional forces, uh, I got like out of shape, right? Uh, like I ate less, I worked out less, I slept less. I was like, wow, the army is, is uh, really easy um, in terms of like, you just do what they tell you uh, and, and you're pretty successful. And, uh, especially during the surge, you could really, you could be a, a loser, but if you could run really fast and do push-ups, then like you were in charge. Uh, I'm not saying that's, that's right, but it's who I was <laughs> and I'm not going to deny it. Right. Uh, <laughs> um, so uh, I got to Fort Campbell 101st, my first unit, uh, kind of became known as the guy who was like really good at his job, but had an attitude problem. Um, and we've all met guys and girls like that that you can if you're good you can get away with a lot right um again i'm not saying it's right but uh so i wound up for that deployment to iraq uh this was in 2007 so like a lot of people in my generation like immediately after school it was time to deploy um so i uh my unit was like hey uh fifth group fort campbell needs support at like this patrol base we're gonna laterally transfer somebody so I, I was the choice. I was the in-shape guy who they couldn't stand to work with. Um, so they got rid of me. Uh, <laughs> uh, that's how, well, that's how the army gets rid of problems, man. right? Yeah, just push um, them off. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I wound up with fifth group and that changed everything. That was, well, you know, I'm, I'm super in shape. I'm super smart. It's like, good for you, man. All of us are. Um, and I had really awesome mentors who um, called me in instead of calling me out, uh, and really put time in to develop me 
uh, and it, it absolutely changed my life and my perspective. Like the experience is downrange as like an 18 year old guy who, who thought I was a grown man uh, in combination with mentorship from men who had like seen it, things I couldn't imagine seeing, but hadn't become cynical and had tried to like prevent me from making their mistakes. And uh, it was just, uh, it was amazing. So I, I wouldn't be who I was if um, some guys didn't see me as like the piece of shit that got sent to them into like an opportunity for sure. Mm. That's awesome. So that, that was in 2000. So this, this deployment is from 07 to 09. It was like 18 okay. months long. Okay. Uh, that, that, that one I remember was like, I saw people come to country after me and leave before me. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Yeah. That's a lot. I mean, a year and a half. That's that a is a point. long time. <laughs> it was a lot. Yeah, it was, uh, it was, I needed it, man. I think just like the way things lined up, um, yeah. I, I definitely, I needed that for sure. Yeah. And so, you know, real quick on a side note, you are wearing sunglasses. So it was, can you just talk to us about that a little bit? Yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> I forgot we've been talking. Right? Yeah, so, yeah. I'm like, yeah, so anybody watching, uh, later in the story, uh, in Afghanistan, um, I was, I uh, suffered a blast injury and I got a TBI. Um, and this is actually really relevant to the, it sounds like a plug, but it's really <laughs> relevant to the, the Aftersoft podcast uh, is that, um, <clears throat> after the blast, um, so they they do the whole like enemy marksmanship medal that's uh, we call the purple heart right it's the enemy marksmanship badge um <laughs> so uh after i got after i got that i was suffering from a lot of symptoms including um chronic migraines insomnia anxiety i was real uh, easily irritable and every doctor in the army I, I spoke with was like it's ptsd like you have you have post-traumatic stress disorder these are all symptoms of trauma you've gone through. I was put on anxiety medication. Um, these were the days Daniel and I have talked about, you know, before you got on the plane to go in country, they were like, if you can't sleep, go over there and you'll get a bottle of Ambien off that table. A bottle. Uh, yeah. <laughs> wildly over prescribing times. Um, and then I got out uh, and I go to the VA in Palo Alto, which half of the doctor there's are the doctors there are Stanford doctors. Um, and I saw a poly trauma team. Um, this was the first time like an optometrist, neurologist, a primary care all talked. Um, so I got imaging done, saw an optometrist and they were like, Hey, you have a traumatic brain injury. Like that's where all these symptoms are coming from. You have basically like superhuman photosensitivity. Um, so these look like uh, cool guy glasses. They're actually like this because they cover my whole eye socket. Um, so no ambient light can get in and they're fitted to my head so I can like do handstand walks in the gym and like they stay on my face or ride roller coasters with my kids. And, uh, from the outside, they look like jet black shades, but from my perspective, they look like clear glasses. Okay. Um, wow. yeah, yeah. So the result is I look like a complete jerk everywhere I go because I wear them <laughs> the most when you shouldn't wear sunglasses, like movie theaters driving at night. So I'm just a permanent Kyle. Um, <laughs> but it it has uh it's it's changed my life like i'm not taking anxiety medication i don't get headaches i'm sleeping again um and i think that is a big transition um into civilian life as i'm i'm viewed and treated as a whole person uh iraq and afghanistan aren't the stem of all my problems and i would say that about anybody with a with a background in soft who who makes it in whether it be through selection ranger school whatever uh chances are you had some kind of trauma before the army or military that gave you the grit to make it through that selection process. Right. So you mm -hmm. tell people like, Hey man, I had issues way before Afghanistan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. South Compton. <laughs> <laughs> well, and so going back to kind of diving into that 07, 09, like you, you came back from, from that deployment and you know, where'd you go from there? Yeah, so I came back um, and I still I still definitely had some I still do. Right. But I still had some some personality kinks to work out. So I kind of I got a taste for blood um, in terms of like doing what I thought was the real mission, you know, like living with uh, with uh, the locals in a country like 
educating, mentoring. Uh, I felt like I was making a difference. Whereas uh, when I was with uh, Big Army, I, I just felt like I, I could drop dead today and it just it wouldn't make a difference. Um, and uh, so I came back and I, I really wanted to keep doing that. But my unit, 101st, and I, I think a million people have this story like me, every school unit organization is willing and ready to take you. But where you are isn't willing to give you up, right? Like the, the permanent people shortage. Um, so they were like, there is no slot for you to go to the school or, you know, you can't go do this. Uh, so group uh, and the guys I worked with there were like, hey, we have slots. Like you want to go to ranger school? Like you want to go to jump school? Um, so every opportunity I got was uh, group gave me their slots like to go do stuff. Um, and that was really awesome to the point where my unit 101st just laterally sent me over uh, to group support because they were like, you know, fine, like go. Uh, and that was, yeah, that was so cool. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm really grateful that took, that took a lot. Um, so, but then I found myself in that environment and I had uh, the first time I really experienced like massive imposter syndrome. Uh, and that will that'll become relevant way later in my life being here at Stanford, right? But having experienced that, but just being like, whoa, like I thought I was something, but I'm around like these dudes are are my heroes. Like these these guys are crazy. You know, you go to like group therapy sessions. Or so I highly advocate for therapy. I'm still in therapy, getting therapy. Um, and you know, guys in a circle talking and, and hearing like a crusty at the time like sergeant first class talking about like picking up pieces of people and uh, and I'm like wow like okay I, I think I can be okay like if that guy's still normal and functioning um you know like I'm good uh, so it was uh it was it was humbling uh, it was a wild experience and then from there um from Campbell uh I started noticing every time I would deploy or do something I spent a lot of time uh, like downrange learning my job, like learning the situations or trying to figure out how to navigate things. And I, I think a lot of us, again, have stories about like X percentage of your deployment or time on target was just like figuring out the situation. And then you're like, man, I, I could have, I wish I had all this other time I wasted doing stuff. Um, so I got sent to Fort Polk, Louisiana to ops group. Um, and I got told to suffer the fate of a man with a good idea. Uh, and we, we developed these, uh, these task forces and what we did was rapidly deployed and came back, uh, and we're constantly bringing back, uh, whether it be, uh, via like a Centrix lab or uh, ourselves, um, everything happened the most relevant, uh, whether it be cultural training, uh, political stuff going on, injuries faced, uh, disease, non-battlefield injuries to give to future deployers. Um, and that was, that was a really cool experience. Um, and then from there, uh, around that time in Afghanistan is when I got injured. Uh, and then I transitioned from, and I think this is an appropriate transition, um, from doing into teaching. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, and I started getting involved in mystics, medical simulation training centers. Uh, so I was an instructor writer at a mystic in Fort Polk. Uh, then I got moved to Fort Jackson and we helped write uh, kind of POI for like TC3 there. Uh, and we were training um, like initial entry trainees. And that went really awesome. Uh, I went to Hawaii. Uh, that was my first time training multinational forces. So I, I was the lead instructor at the Mystic in Hawaii, working with all the branches there. Uh, and that was really awesome. Uh, and then my my final like duty station was fort hood texas uh gross is uh Our the place. that's the <laughs> yeah that was gross man um that's the largest mystic in all of dod um so that's when i met uh like a, a mutual friend of daniel and i's caleb twilliger uh from medco um and we're, we're doing more mystic training and then my kind of my swan song before i retired was developing uh, POI to bridge the gap um, in terms of like training conventional medics don't have. Because I had the advantage of, uh, I was originally just like a regular medic. 
And then I became a Whiskey One, um, special operations combat medic for anybody, I guess, else who's listening. Um, so I kind of saw both worlds and was like, wow, like no one ever told me this, right? Mm -hmm. So we were developing training for example, um, regular army medics don't know how to do like prolonged field care. Uh, and you know, we can get really into the weeds and say, arguably the next fight we get into is going to be a, a near peer enemy where, you know, the cash is like 40 clicks behind the flaw. And like, you're sitting on that casualty for 36 to 72 hours. And regular medics are, are they're not ready for that right now. It's not their fault. They, they, they're great trained, but they're only trained. They only know what they're trained to know. Um, so we, I worked with Caleb and Medco and we were developing POI for that. Um, and then, uh, I retired uh, and I got uh, an offer out here at Stanford. Um, and I currently work at the Stanford school of medicines, uh, center for immersive and simulation based learning. Um, and that was a lot. So yeah, so there's, there's kind of a longest short version. That, that's pretty cool, man. Stanford. I mean, but yeah, the, going the from being a, a regular medic, <laughs> getting getting <laughs> recruited out of jail, um, to uh, to going through being part of a, a group, going through special ops combat medic course, and uh, doing all this training. So the the thing that interests me about your story specifically is education. So. You, you've been a teacher, um, instructor, writer, right? Am I saying that right? Teacher's fine. Who gives a shit? Here's anyway, the... <laughs> so, so, so you've, you've taught for, for the Army, and then yeah. you've completed education. And education while you're in the military, especially graduate degrees, that's, that's a difficult thing to be able to go out and be part of the fight and uh, be able to get college done just maintain that focus um can you talk us through a little bit of of when you first saw the opportunity because you joined the army at 18 yeah and so you had to build up that uh undergrad and then when you left the army you had two master's degrees uh three three well three no masters. i had two i finished my third uh shortly after retiring okay so I, wow. yes. um <laughs> Yeah. So no, good question, man. Um, this is, if I had a, a soapbox or a, like a thing, it would be advocating for, uh, people still in and veterans and education. Um, two things I would say fed the most into my drive for education while I was in one coming from a place of like really low socioeconomic status. I knew the difference between the haves and have nots was higher education. Right. Um, and learning that while I was in the army, I could get free education was wild. I was like, why is everybody not doing this? Um, and then it was because it was hard. It was inconvenient, right? Like, well, I'm always going to the field. I'm always, dude, take one class at a time. Like do, well, is, I don't know, uh, insert name of university here, right? Uh, is that even real, like a real school? Is it accredited? It's all I care about. Right. That's that's if it's accredited, it's a real school. Right. Mm -hmm. um, especially if you're an undergrad. No one gives a crap. Um, and then the imposter syndrome, man, like being around, uh, you know, group guys um, and rangers. I I was doing nothing but studying constantly. I was so terrified that like I would get called or it would be my turn. And that was it. My shot was blown. I blew it like some I I. I someone died even they didn't have to or you know they saw straight through like what a loser i was and like there would be my shot um i was never treated like that a lot of that says more about me than the people i was around right let's make that clear um but it was just like i was just hungry to be as you know to to earn my place where i was um so i started using tuition assistance and pell grants um took me a long time uh, but i got an undergraduate degree in religion um, and I have master's degrees in exercise physiology, uh, psychology with a concentration in personality psychology and sociology. Uh, and the motivation for that was um, working with USASOC, right? Like everything about that is understanding people, their personalities, um, how important r religion is in one's culture, you know, how the group influences the person and the other way around. 
exercise physiologist because I was a bro surrounded by bros and I wanted to be smarter about, you know, health and wellness and fitness. Um, so a, a lot of that seems kind of random or weird, but when you take the context I was in, it's like, cool. And that's more advice I give for education is study things you're a nerd about, like you're passionate about, especially when you get to the graduate level is like, you're, you can't just grit your teeth through that, man. Like you, you have to believe in what you're doing or, or be hungry for it. Yeah. I mean, that, that's, um, I'm just kind of look reviewing everything we've talked about in your story, right? Like it's the, I don't want to say the American dream, right? But it's like the opportunity that's presented right in this country is someone from your background, maybe not, you know, your, like you said, your socioeconomic background, probably getting into a little bit of trouble, right? And, oh, and, yeah. <laughs> and you know, the military, for all that it is, it does offer opportunity, and, and you took advantage of that. Getting education, um, I, I mean, your journey from where you were at 18 to where you are now is, is pretty incredible, and in all the things you've had to overcome to get there. Um, we talk a lot about education and, and, and part of the, part of the discussion, right? When folks are moving on to second careers from the military, they look at education from two perspectives. One is how are we, how is that going to get me a job? Right. Um, mm. and then second, you know, how prestigious is the university, right? Yeah. yeah. We, we do think yeah. about the prestigious, uh, aspect of, of whatever university and we've been in uh, discussion with people who talk about their um, MBA program. There are a lot of good MBA programs and their focus is not just the institution, but it's the network that you build from that. So I, I see some of these graduate um, and post post doctoral programs kind of having uh the it's not just the education but it's you're putting yourself in an environment where it's what we've always done you're you're putting yourself in an environment where there are high performers and ultimately that's what that's about is hey cuz we're going to have to go through the the story of how you got to Stanford anyway but but you're you're taking guys who have been pushing themselves in high performance areas and then they see the opportunity to be at a school that we all think, oh man, that must be really good because that's where all the really good people go. But it, it's just following the trend that a lot of us have set in our lives is, is hey, we're going to always be where things are harder, more difficult, things are happening but there's that big network part to it that the guys that we've talked to, the network is a huge part of that. Mm -hmm. So and yeah, I think and you learn that that translates over into like, even like army education, right. Or whatever branch you're in, but we were talking earlier about like PLDC or how many courses have you been to that are bullshit and you got nothing out of them, but the connections you made that you're like, oh, dude, I should call that guy in Germany. He knows about this thing that I want to do. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think we we're always trained for that. It's like, yeah, net networking and the value of like make a friend in five minutes or die. You know, like that's that's uh, so many of, of our as a group are um, necessities for life or death. Uh, when once you get out, are our character strengths that are much easier to apply when they're they're low stakes to other people they're high stakes right like but when you know the three of us are in rooms right now and you're like dude nobody's gonna die over this decision like this is the stress level is way down mm -hmm. yeah yeah no i <laughs> think think about all the anxiety you know yeah the college application process, the picking a college, why I get accepted, what program, you know, all of that anxiety is just, it's not really important. Well, I, and <laughs> yeah. I, I think to us, it's just like, oh, it's a pain in the ass. So like yeah. the, where, where we procrastinate is not because that gives us anxiety. Stupid stuff yeah. is just stupid stuff and, yeah. and, and we can get through that. There's other things yeah. that, that, that drive the anxiety. Or but You have to write an essay for each application and you're like, Tell me about your life or what, what life, ex what 
has happened in your life that's shaped, you know, and you're like, oh my gosh. <laughs> Dude, what my Stanford interview, uh, there's like seven interviews, but one of my Stanford interviews, they were like, hey, um, I'm on staff here, right? And they were like, you know, it, it, this job position requires, you know, you're going to be in stressful situations. Um, can you give us an example of a stressful situation, how you manage through it? Um, and I began to discuss, uh, like one of my first missions in Iraq when I was 18, uh, was a mass cal, um, mass casualty situation. Right. Um, not going to go into that, but like, if you know, you know, uh, and then the whole interview, like there were two associate deans, like they just like got dead silent and they were like, okay, um, that sounds very stressful. Uh, do, do you have any that you might actually encounter in this environment? <laughs> uh, and you're like, oh, oh yeah, okay. So then, like, then it, I just thought of like an everyday situation for us is just like, oh, here's a, an example of me like navigating stress. But yeah. yeah, for sure, like just doing interviews and and realizing like, uh, <clears throat> oh wow, like I'm in a different world now, and that. That is, a, to me, an excellent segue into um, having, I'm just over a year out now, um, and that reaction from people has actually made me realize how kind of uh, like isolating or lonely it can be being a veteran because you you can no longer empathize with a lot of people without it being like a, a huge ordeal or like an attention grabbing thing, whereas like if, if the three of us were to make a joke right now, like, oh my God, like that smell, like that's what like burning flesh smells like. It's an extreme example, but you get it. And you're like, mm -hmm. oh dude, yeah, that's so rotten. I wish I had like a wild tiger to wash it down, you know? <laughs> uh, and, uh, <laughs> but you say, you say stuff like that in, you know, higher education academia and people look at you like, oh my God, are, are you okay? Mm -hmm. and I'm like, oh crap, man. Like, so, uh, uh, you kind of miss people you can like empathize with. And I, I think that's helped me here at Stanford because um, I wound up getting really close with the emergency medicine, the EMED faculty and people because they get it, they know mm -hmm. trauma. So like I, I had to find a community that I could empathize and fit in with, right? Unless you're a sociopath, like right. you need that. Um, yeah, so I, I that's, uh, that's, to me, that's a big thing is, um, yeah, you, you got to find a tribe, man. <laughs> yeah. Well, and we, we've talked about this on, on a previous episode. Someone brought it up about, um, yeah, nobody wants to hear your war stories. Yeah. Right? Like <laughs> we, we, we tend, I don't, I don't know what the right word is. Like we don't, there's certainly fresh in our minds, right. As, as big experiences that have impacted our lives. Right. But to everybody else, like that's not what they want to hear or, they want to hear it in a social setting, not in a professional setting, right? They want mm -hmm. to hear your story of some quote unquote cool thing you did overseas um, in a social environment. But when you're, when you're at work, they don't want to hear about your combat experience, right? They want to and see I would how, take that one step farther and say sometimes not only do they not want to, sometimes I don't want to tell yeah. them, right? Yeah. Like how many times are I, my, my glasses, right? Like I don't, I don't have to, and I don't, but, I don't want to explain a traumatic event that permanently disabled me every single day because you want to know about why I wear sunglasses, mm -hmm. right? So just like, you know, you say something and people are like, whoa, like, can you talk to me about that? I'm like, no, I, I really don't want to. Like a lot of guys I'd say who, who war story people, I say there's typically one of two dudes, liars and sociopaths, right? Mm -hmm. Like either, either you're insane because human life is human life and that, that had to do something to you. Or you're full of crap. If if that was your experience, you would not be like giggling through this story right now. You know. Yeah. yeah. Well, but I, and two, like, and I want I want to hear your perspective. And I know we have a, a format we got to follow. But the your and you hinted on this sort of your your journey to sort of perspective of your experiences, your combat experiences, and and seeing how other like transitioning that viewpoint right because i think that's mm -hmm. that's a sticking point for a lot of folks that that are getting out and finding second careers is 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 how do you how do you change your perspective of of those were the things that were defining and, and maybe even promotable things in your military career now you've got to translate that in a different format right you got to translate that to 
a civilian society of like, yeah, this is how I deal with stress or these are your, what, what was your journey like with that? I mean, you, your interviews, you mentioned that, but like, mm -hmm. yeah. So I think it's, um, one, it's realizing that you're, you're not a special snowflake. Um, so all the trauma, the experiences I could, I could talk to a, a Los Angeles paramedic right now who could make me look like I had an easy career, you know? So one, you need to, we need to humble ourselves and be like, all right, I'm not that special. There are parallel experiences, right? And that's also encouraging that there are parallel experiences. Um, and then <clears throat> getting through like awareness of the self. So for example, um, realizing that um, in the military, uh, especially in combat operations, you're often taught to um, exercise initiative in the absence of orders, right? Like you need to move forward and carry things out knowing that you have limited information. All right. So that is a conditioned psychologically. That is a conditioned response in me. Um, knowing that about myself makes me have to recondition that behavior because in academia, uh, I, I can't act with limited information. I need to get an information gathering mode and then make well thought out decisions that I, I soundboard to my left and right, or even, you know, above me sometimes. Um, so I think the, the two short answers to your question are find parallels to your experience because they are there, um, and be aware of yourself and, you know, why it is that you are uh, the way you are so that, you know, you can recondition any behavior. You can figure out, you know, strengths, um, and, and know that there's, there's a time and a place for those strengths. Yeah. Yeah. That. Th that we've talked uh, uh, hours right <laughs> yeah. and in, in in you applying that you know figuring out where your strengths are and everything you served 15 years is it 15 years in the army yeah 15 uh june 06 to june 21 so you made a decision to get out earlier than most people yeah and there was something that played into that we we had a good conversation a while back where uh, the guy that we were talking to um, had said plan you know make a plan for what you're doing but mm -hmm. I, I know I don't want to get into a long conversation but uh, about what I did but I knew the 10-year mark was coming up so I said oh I'm I'm ready to get out I made that decision prior to hitting that halfway mark you went over that but there was something that influenced you in in your decision making process to get out and had you gotten picked up for stanford prior to what did that look like for you yeah so good question remember we talked about this we make up we as people make up these completely imaginary boundaries and goals and rules like so many guys um and like Disclaimer, guys and girls, right? I'm not just in my experience. It was a mostly male environment, right? Before I like get canceled. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but so many guys hit that. They see 10 years as like, well, once I hit 10, I'm doing 20. Like, bro, that's another 10 years of your life. Mm -hmm. Like, what do you mean? Like, in what other universe are people like, I might as well do another 10 years. That's mm -hmm. insane. Mm -hmm. um, and then I always promised myself, I saw this in people. And anybody listening to this, if you were in the military, you've seen this in people, the E6 or like O3, who's just like rotting toxic in a position because they're like, well, if I just ride out this five years, you know, I'm going to retire. Like, first of all, get out of the way so that other people can excel. Like, just, let's just say that get out of the way because there's a person waiting to get promoted and do great things. And you're just sitting in their spot. And two, a job with such high stakes is not like a well fuck it type scenario right like you you can't just sit there to collect your five more years for retirement when like people's lives and like governments are on the line um so for me it was once i realized there were two events once i realized that i was not buying what i was selling i was it clicked i was like it's time to go like i can't be that guy it's time to go the first one was when I got medevaced, um, woke up in the hospital in long stool. The very first thing anybody said to me, like conscious, like, whoa, I'm not dead, uh, was, uh, hey, 
we need you to get in this wheelchair um, and go down to the first floor so we can like do the paperwork to cut off your combat pay. Um, and yeah, that's when I was like, and I'm I like, my feelings are hurt about it. They were then, right? Because um, yeah. I, I thought I was more important than I was. Um, that's when I was like, the army does not care about me. Like I'm giving my life, my blood, sweat, and tears, a divorce. <laughs> like uh, I'm giving my life for something that is like, hey, you're not dead. I need you to go downstairs so we can fix the pay situation. Uh, <laughs> we, need to, we need to start taxing you. <laughs> yeah, that like that was the first like hint of a, of an abusive relationship to parallel. Like, 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 like I don't think I I think this is a red flag. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then the whole time you're in the army, you get told it's it, it's in a, it, for me uh, often it's an abusive relationship that you're like you, you think I'll never do this good. Nobody will ever want me as much as this does. I'll never be as successful as like you just keep telling yourself these lies. Um, and then um, when I was uh, building that POI at the Mystic at Fort Hood and at Fort Hood, this is around the time where like every weekend like that, that young woman um, mm. was killed in her unit armory, um, which is terrible, yeah. right? They were, um, they were finding people's bodies off post and seeing the response of, um, you know, every weekend getting calls about suicidal ideation um, and DUIs and domestic violence and, and very real tragic things that are that it happened so often they were being made light of or just looked over. Um, and I was like, I, I don't believe in this anymore. Um, and so I went to the doctor and I was like, hey, um, you can look at my medical record. I earned a purple heart back in 2012. Um, I have like permanent profiles to just keep going like I'm done. Uh, um, I just want to retire. Uh, so I medically retired at 15 years. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's uh, abusive relationship. I mean, it, it, yeah, it certainly, <laughs> I think a lot of people would agree with that. that definitely. <laughs> and I, well, and, and there is that truth that, that you end up being part of that abusive process to other people. If, if you yeah. don't make the decision to get out too. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and so many times we tell ourselves, Oh, Oh, this isn't going to be able to survive without me, mm. you know, because they told me that I'm important, but there's someone, there's someone sitting there waiting to take that position. Yeah. Or, yeah. or you believe, you know, I'm not important without this, right? Like you've, you've solely yeah. defined yourself based I on that, on that. Right. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, yeah. Or like if the true answer is this wouldn't survive without me, then me is the problem. What what have I done to make me the the hinge of success for an entire organization or program? Like I remember my first ex like exposure working on a team was I realized that everybody on the team was an assistant whatever. So like every dude on the team was trained to like take over another dude's job. And to someone who had always been an 18 X-ray or an operator or whatever, uh, like it made sense to them. But as someone who was like, like taken under wings and like put into that community. It was like mind blowing. I was like, whoa, like nothing should ever depend on one person. Like mm -hmm. I should literally be able to get shot in the face and like things need to keep happening, you know? Right. Make yourself replaceable. Yeah. 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 So the, you got out at 15, when did you get recruited or when did you apply to get into uh, Stanford? So I, um, I was finishing up my third master's degree. Um, and of all things, say that so I swear, casually. <laughs> just my third. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's a sim sim simple. I was hoping it was yeah. like, um, like a punch card, you know, like a green beans coffee. Like yeah. if I get enough master's degrees, will they make me a doctor? You get one for free, <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> um, so, um, I was on LinkedIn of all places. Uh, and I was again, terrified. Uh, it, it, would I admit it then? No, but it's true. I was scared of like, this is all I've done my entire adult life. We're always told what potential we have, or you hear, um, like podcasts, you know, you guys, or you, you, you hear things you're like, man, like the soft community crushes it. You know, like there's, there's job offers abound. And I just heard 
crickets, you know? Uh, yeah. So it, like all things, it was self-motivated. So I got on um, LinkedIn um, and a few other like sites and networking. And I told myself uh, every day I would do three to five job applications. Um, and this is when I was like six months out from retiring. Um, and I stuck to that every single day. I, I submitted three to five job applications, which was redoing resumes and cover letters for like all of them, right? Cause it needs to be individualized to that job. Uh, it was really hard work. Um, I got rejected exponentially more than I got callbacks and stuff like that. The, the most encouraging, um, I guess points from that one was I kept learning what people wanted, mm -hmm. um, what the civilian workforce wanted and needed. So every, um, in psychology, we call that having positive versus negative attributions, right? Like I learned, uh, I was using those as learning experiences to make every subsequent one better. Um, and the, the encouraging rejections were times where people would call me, recruiters would call me and be like, I, I can't pay you what you're worth. Like, don't take this job. Um, and that was nice. <laughs> uh, that felt good. And then sure enough, um, I saw Stanford. I was like, yeah. Okay, sure. Uh, and I got a call back and that was, uh, that was validating by itself for me. I was like, what the hell? Like I got a job interview at, at the Stanford school of medicine, the most selective school in the nation, less than 4% of applicants get in, um, and went through the interview process. Uh, and then they offered me the job and I had to like, extend out my start date several weeks so I could like retire and get out and get to Stanford in California. Um, and that was my first time, uh, really seeing the fruits of like my value and that that would never happen in the army. Everything's right now. Everything's an emergency. You know, when everything's an emergency, nothing's an emergency. Um, mm -hmm. so I was, I was terrified. I was like, Oh man, I don't, get out until like this day, that's like four weeks away. And my department head at Stanford was like, that's fine. Like we, we hire, we are, we're hiring you because you're the best person for the job, not because we need someone right now. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, sure. And they were like, actually, do you want a couple more weeks? Surely after transitioning out of a 15 year career, you probably want some time with your family to, you know, take a breath and, um, it was wild again the abusive relationship analogy it was wild to be like what is this <laughs> um like this common decency <laughs> uh so i like i like ets on a friday uh and like got to stanford on like a monday wow. okay i changed computers I should be good now. <laughs> no worries man no worries um so, so patrick was just talking about how you translate all that um in on resumes and how we have organizations and things like that yeah there, i mean there's such a big focus for many years of like here's how to build a resume right or here's how to do your cover letter here's but you're telling a story right and so for your ability to recognize you know at that stage of your life as you were retiring um that you needed to tell a story that was going to be listened to by a civilian population, right? Like it's no longer telling you about your military accolades, but you're telling a story about yourself, who you are, where you came from in a way that people can interpret it um, to see value. And I think a big with the resume hey. to, to, to what the hell am I talking about? <laughs> Is that German? <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, Two important things I've seen is veterans tend to go one of two ways. One, they come up with this like 20 page resume that is just, it's too much, man. I get it, Sergeant Major, Joe Bob, like you won the war on terror, but like <laughs> that's not relevant to this job or this MBA, right? Mm -hmm. um, but then there's the other way around that uh, guys don't give themselves enough credit or they can't see the parallels of their experience. And someone's like, the only job experience on your resume is the army for 15 years. Surely you did some things in the army, you know, like you, you can't just say I did this, you know, like you, you had to have some transferable skills in there. So I think we often tend to go one of two ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, it's, 
that's that's the hard part right is is reconditioning yourself and translating that experiences into civilian life right like those parallel experiences uh, yeah 100 percent. so what what um so, so now I, yeah you're at stanford so you're at stanford doing a phd in what kind of psychology uh developmental psychology so the big question is what are you doing with that going forward um what's your what's what's yeah, your so goal? My goal is um with psychology my my goal in research is to understand the relationship between religiosity and personality across culture uh, and that comes from uh, my own background and then obviously having traveled the world and seeing religion is such an integral part of culture and culture is such a key part of the development of a person and development meaning throughout one's entire lifespan developmental psychology isn't just childhood adolescence right we're constantly developing uh, so it's like hey what's that like um, for example, uh, what is it that makes, um, and these are just hypothetical questions, right? I'm not saying this is true. Uh, is there something about Islam that makes Muslims more or less likely to develop depression or PTSD than Christians or Jews or Hindus, right? Like, um, we need to understand these things so we can treat people, um, with more, uh, like knowledge of culture. Uh, so, and that's something, you know, you learn operating in different countries is you have to understand the context of where you are if you want to help these people, because your answers that work for you are not relevant here. Um, and we see this happen in psychology already. One of the most evidence-based treatment methods, uh, involves, uh, mindfulness, right? And mindfulness comes straight from Buddhism. Mm -hmm. Uh, so what is it cool like do do the does islam have some things that you know are gonna be really good for psychology does judaism does you know zoroastrianism i don't know come up with something there um but so just having experienced culture all over the world and seeing you know what it does to people um that's kind of the goal of my of my life's work uh, and then what i do at stanford is i basically work at um Stanford's version of a mystic, like we talked about earlier, medical simulation training center. So it's called the Sizzle, like I said, the Center for Immersive and Simulation Based Learning. Um, and it's almost like a super high tech movie studio at the School of Medicine. And we teach through experiential learning, doing like medical simulation in the army, you might call that doing trauma lanes, you know, stuff like that. But we can do that and um, we can simulate people having a heart attack or aortic dissection, anaphylaxis. Um, and it allows us to, to teach students through experiential learning things that uh, they wouldn't be able to do to a person. Uh, we're not we're not doing goat lab at Stanford. So we got to figure out a way to simulate, uh, you know, taking care of people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I mean, it's experience is the best teacher, right? So the fact that you're I mean, that's the future of this whole thing. So do you see yourself continuing in that in that space or, you're, or you want to branch out with your PhD? I mean, you're after your PhD. Um, so I see myself doing both. Uh, something again, soft taught me was uh, it, it seems like mostly conventional guys let their job become their identity. Uh, like they get off work and that's all they do and their bumper sticker has every single badge and achievement they've done in their career. And they walk around like holding up their CAC card at concerts, asking for a military discount, right? <laughs> like, uh, I would say most operators would agree, like that's just making a target on your own back. Like, why are you doing that? Like, you should just be blending in like everyone else. Um, and part of that is separating your identity from your vocation. Uh, and it's a long way around of saying I have my PhD and my research and my passion, and I have my job and my career that I, I love. And sometimes they intersect and that's beautiful, perfect harmony. Like I talk about um, using the psychology of persuasion in the school of medicine to get learners to collaborate more um, and, or to foster interdepartmental cooperation. And that's a really cool marriage. But for the most part, they stay separate. And, uh, and I like it that way. You know, I don't want, my research and my passion and what wakes me up to be what pays my bills. Cause even subconsciously that's going to affect you, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. 
that's a big thing in life for for not just those of us in uh with that are veterans but for everybody i to be able to separate that um and, and even especially with the 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 more uh, education you do i i think a lot of people look at themselves as oh i'm a professor or i'm this or i'm that but there there is that separation that, that can be made and, and your life's not as dependent on 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 that on your there's a difference between that identity and and vocation Mm -hmm. and look at that when you when you use that to identify yourself then you're lost when you don't have it Mm -hmm. you know like i'm a soldier what happens when you're not Mm -hmm. like you 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 put the foundation of everything over i am this but if you say hey i'm a person who um is really good at working in a team is self-motivated, works well under stress. If you use the characteristics of the identity, you can apply that anywhere and wind up working at Stanford or doing a PhD or running a podcast and being successful at real estate. You know, like you, if you, once you take the position as your identity, like you're, you're screwing yourself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, and I love, you know, looking back over your journey, you know, you, you followed your curiosity, right? Like you, you pursued learning. Um, whereas, you know, a lot, a lot of us and a lot of folks will pursue the profession, right. Or, or income. Right. So Mm -hmm. I, I think that's a really cool journey you've been on from, you know, your adolescent stage through the military, continuing to pursue, your curiosity learning and then you know now in a position to you're still learning but you're teaching right you're giving back in that sense um that's a it's a pretty awesome journey you've been on man yeah well i think a a big highlight that i i can't say enough is um this is built on the backs of of men who were who were hurt forgotten about and broken for a long time um, and I had to learn from their lessons, right? There were mentors that were like, dude, I wish I'd have done school when I was your age. Like, like, trust me, mm-hmm. get in school. You know, there were, um, m- mentors that were like, Hey, document everything that like, you get a cough. You better put a note in that crap because you're going to get out and have nothing documented and spend your life with the VA trying to justify a percentage and me being like, whatever, or, or men telling me, Hey, I'm retiring at 20 years and like, I don't know my kids. Like I was chasing badges and patches for so long that this ends and like, I don't know my own family. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then with the VA, I've had, I've had excellent care with the VA. I've had excellent access to care. Uh, None of my payments have gone wrong. My GI bill is going great. And I, I realize the blessing and the privilege that is of, of people who fought for a long time to even get what they deserve or, or never did. Right. So I think it's super important that um, a lot of this, I, I it was self-motivated and I worked hard. A lot of this was, was learning from other people's mistakes and that I'm getting taken care of because we we've, we've learned from hurting other people. And like, I have to acknowledge that. Yeah. Yeah. It's good. Yeah. I, I loved what you talked about with, you know, the word reconditioning. Um, I love what you talked about identity, right? I mean, I, and we go back to this and we talk about different things in different episodes, but when we come from a, a position of looking at things from a performance, right? Uh, especially the guys that are still on active duty, you know, if you take this information and you put it in a performance context, you know, your identity on a team or in soft or anything should not solely, that's, that's a hindrance on your performance, right? You should be looking holistically at your, your strengths and your weaknesses and how that adds value to the team rather than this is my profession. I'm a 18 Delta. I'm a, I'm a Zulu or you know, whatever your role is, is not necessarily your identity and, and ensuring that we don't, that we can separate the two will increase the ability for performance. Yeah. And it goes back to that humility and, um, having the gratitude to see that those, uh, before you, uh, have, have paved the way yeah. that, um, you know, we're standing on the sh- uh, shoulders of giants as they say. Yeah. So thank you, Remy, for joining us today. We really 
appreciate all that uh, the value that you add and uh, the insight um, that, that you bring from uh, cutting a, a career short um, and focusing on education and, and understanding um, the direction that you're you're going yeah yeah man thanks uh thanks for the platform thanks for the space uh i, I appreciate it very much very grateful yeah it's awesome best luck man and uh look forward to seeing all the cool things you'll do at stanford and beyond and beyond so. yeah america <laughs> <laughs>